46 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted.
to be able to uh, mean those words that uh, though the world is falling around um, in every corner that we can look to you and uh, we can trust that you are still on the throne that you are the God who neither slumbers nor sleeps you never cede power even for a moment what a savior we have in our Lord Jesus reminded us that uh, greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. Jesus, we owe you everything. And I pray that as we continue in this time of worship, you would remind us just what that everything is that we owe to you. Lord, keep us from distraction. Help us to keep our minds fixed on the one who loves us, the one who gave himself for us. We owe him everything. We thank you for your sovereign control over all things. We thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, how strong the power of Jesus' name. It is stronger than it name. How sweet the victory that bore my shame, took the burden of my sin away. Hallelujah. What a Savior. I owe everything to you. Hallelujah.
Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up these numerous cancer re prayer requests to you, Lord, for chemo and transplants and breast cancer and everybody that's dealing with something or who has dealt with something. And Lord, we just want to lift up those families to you right now that are dealing with that. Lord, we also want to lift up the families that are dealing with the, with the horrific collapse in Florida and the wildfires out west and Everybody who's involved in that, be with the first responders. It's going to be a, a tough time for them to get over this uh, when, when it is all done. Lord, we just want to continue to lift them up to you. And Lord, for the families that are transferring out of the base, there's, there's that time of year and new families are moving in. We just ask that your peace will be upon each one. We have friends that are moving on and just want to keep the, lifting them up to you. Lord, as we gather today, we just want to also want to seek your face for the future of this church and how we're going forward. We just want to keep that in, in the forefront as well, Lord. Be with Bruce and Sarah and keep your hedge, hedge of protection around them. Peggy and Cameron, Lord, down in Brazil. And just a lot of stuff is going on down there. We just ask for protection as well. Lord, thank you for this day and, and just guide us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I was going to share a praise, but I figured I'd just take, take it from my own time here. Um, so the, in the month of, Jan in month of June, early in June, uh, my family moved. And if you've ever moved, you lift a lot of things. And there was couches and boxes and, and you know, furniture and appliances and just you name it, you name it, you name it. And there was just a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff to lift and move. And then if that weren't enough, uh, just two weeks ago uh, at, at Trinity Christian Academy, we had to move a bunch of offices around. So it was desks and file cabinets, fireproof file cabinets, if you can imagine what that weighs. And uh, so it was moving and moving and moving. And, um, and I was fine, you know. Um, but then on Wednesday morning at 5.30, I bent over to pick up a pair of slippers off the floor and I instantly collapsed. I mean, literally collapsed to the floor. And I laid there for 45 minutes before, my wife is a sound sleeper, uh, for 45 minutes <laughs> before uh, I was able to roll over onto my stomach and crawl on all fours back to the bed and in a 10 minute process, get myself back into bed. And it ached to breathe. I'd never had an experience like that ever. And all day long, you know, Advil, Aleve, you name it, trying to figure out what is the most I can take without killing myself. Um, and eventually getting a doctor's appointment. And it's a humbling thing when 80-year-olds are jumping up to hold doors open for you. But when you have a cane in one hand and your arm around your five-foot-two wife, uh, just to shuffle into the doctor's office. Uh, I, when I tell you I literally could not walk for two days this week, um, and I'm telling you all this because uh, as of a couple days ago, G God started this process of healing, but he did more than that. He started to say something to me, which is to remind me of something that I've been saying for a year now. This is a year of pastoring full-time, uh, full-time at Trinity, taking a master's class, moving, funerals, uh, on and on and on. You know, family issues happening, two young kids, on and on and on and on. And I kept saying, you know what, this is a season, this is a season, this is a season. But guess what? A couple of weeks ago, that season was over, and I didn't stop. I just kept going. I just kept pouring myself into other things. And you remember that episode in, in uh, that, that story in Genesis when God touched Jacob on the hip and the wrestling match was over, done, All right? God reached down this week and said, you're done. Stop. And it reminded me of a song that I hadn't sung in church in a long time, but I, sung it in the I sang it in the church that I grew up in, and there was a, there was a line that I never used to sing when I first learned the song because I didn't like it. Um, so this, the line before it is, there are higher heights, there are deeper seas, and then I would go, mm -hmm, and then I would sing the following line because I didn't like this line, and that line is this, whatever you need to do, Lord, do in me. Whatever you need to do, 
Lord, do in me. Do you know what kind of a prayer that is? Do you know how dangerous a prayer that is? I knew a woman uh, one time whose husband wasn't a believer, and she said, you know what? I'm praying that one day I'll want to pray that prayer for my husband, but I don't know what he might do if I do. And so uh, I'm, I want to sing this song before I, I, I bring the message today. Just as a, as a testimony of, of God's faithfulness, our God is so in control, and even the hard things that happen, I've never had a time in my life when I couldn't walk supposed to go on vacation next week I began to think am I not going to be at my own family reunion and God said be still and know that I'm God if you know it sing along I will never be scripture reading found in Isaiah 6 verses 1 through 10 in the year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple above him were seraphs each with six wings with two wings they covered their face with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with the live coal in his hand, 
which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell the people this. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. You just join me in prayer. Uh, Lord, as we look to your word, show us what it means to be children of a God who calls. Show us what it means to be sons and daughters of a king who is alive, who is sovereign, who is in full control, and speaks to his children. Father, right now, during this time, don't let it be lost on us that in your word, you're calling. Give us ears to hear. Give us minds to understand. Give us hearts full of courage and faith to put into action what you have to say. I pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is week three uh, of this series that I'm doing called uh, When the Call Comes. And we're looking through Scripture at what does it mean to be children of a God who calls? God who speaks, God who interacts with His children, God who reaches out to each one of us and wants a relationship with each of us. Make no mistake, our God is a God who calls. If Scripture teaches us anything about the call of God, though, it's that His calls are always on His terms, they're on His timetable, and they're for the glory of His name and the building of His kingdom. (laughs) And you might say, well, that's kind of selfish. And I would say, well, He's God. The Bible is so crystal clear on this point. He is the God who literally called creation into being, Genesis 1 and 2. He's the God who called Noah to build an ark. He's the God who called Elijah to the showdown on Mount Carmel. He's the God who called Abraham to the promised land. He's the God who called Joshua to cross the Jordan and claim that land. He's the God who called Ruth to serve her mother-in-law, Naomi. The God who called Gideon to quit hiding and start leading. The God who called David in from the pasture to the very throne of Israel. He called Jonah to foreign Nineveh. He called Philip to minister to the Ethiopian. He called Saul to be ministered to by Ananias. And of course, God became flesh, the man Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us. And God in the flesh called 12 men to become his followers, his disciples. Jesus who called demons out of Mary Magdalene who called Zacchaeus to repentance, who called Nicodemus to be born again, who called Lazarus out of the grave. I don't think I'm overstating the point when I say, if you don't believe our God is a God who calls, I don't think you understand the God you may say you follow. I'll go a step further and say, if you don't believe that our God is a God who calls, you're most likely living a so-called Christian life completely absent the power and the passion that that life is supposed to be marked by. And yet, it is so simple to develop a theology, a way of thinking about God that gets us out of this bind. We simply say, well, you you know what? God called and worked in ways in biblical times, but now we have the Holy Spirit, so God doesn't really call like that, like he did back then. There are entire denominations built upon that very principle. God used to do those things, but now God is in a new phase of history, or what some theologians would call dispensation. And in this particular one, he doesn't do those speaky things anymore. He doesn't do those talky things anymore. He doesn't do those miracle things anymore. Because we have the Bible, and we have the Holy Spirit, and therefore we have all that we need. But in reality... 
instead of letting us let ourselves off the hook, the reality of the coming of the Holy Spirit puts us on the hook like never before. We just finished an entire series as a church about doing the things that Jesus had done. The greater things that Jesus said we are going to do if we love him and are following him. That we're going to do greater things than even Jesus. And Jesus spoke that. He said, anyone who believes in me will do what I've been doing. In fact, do greater things. John 14, 12. So th think of it this way. Imagine a person 75 years ago saying, listen, I, I live in a remote area. I live in a really remote zip code. Maybe you've lived in a place like this. Uh, just very lonely telephone lines uh, leading off into what looks like a very bleak horizon. From time to time, 75 years ago, maybe that person could travel to a place where they had a phone, and occasionally you could make a phone call. That's how phone calls used to work, believe it or not. My kids didn't even know what a rotary phone was, okay? I'm going way back now. This is even before my time, way back, right? Sometimes you had to go to other people's house to use the phone. And compare that now. Think of that person living in a remote area, having to go somewhere, maybe the general store or whatever, to make a phone call, and compare that person to all of us sitting here, listening to this message, all of us, I'm sure, holding a little black rectangle somewhere around that we can pick up, we can hit some numbers, and in a second start talking to a person on the other side of the earth. I mean, just think about that. In that short time frame. The Bible, from Genesis through Acts chapter 1, as a matter of fact, all of the Old Testament, and then Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts chapter 1, is that first person out by the telephone poles, living remotely, traveling miles to make a call at the temple where we were called to go three times a year to commune with and worship our Lord and God in Jerusalem, to be forgiven, to worship, to be renewed. Experiencing the call of God was a ton of work. A ton of work. After Acts chapter 2, however, God gave you the smartest smartphone in the entire universe. He gave you direct access to his very indwelling presence, and the plan is unlimited. The dividing curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom, giving you and I direct access, direct connection, direct communion, direct calls, and to receive the same. When we respond to God's call for relationship, spiritually speaking, we tune into the channel through which God calls us into action. And that's where we're going to be. We, we looked at Samuel a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and God calling to Samuel, and that call was a call to relationship. God was calling Samuel into relationship with himself. But now this is the second week that we've had the same reading. I know if you were listening to Hannah do the reading, you're like, I think that was the reading last week. I think maybe Pastor had one too many muscle relaxers this week. And No, I wanted us to hear it twice. Because what God is doing in this passage in Isaiah chapter 6 is he's calling Isaiah out of his routine as a God follower. It's, he already was in relationship with God, but now he was calling him to radical obedience to God. And it was something quite different. This is what's happening here in Isaiah chapter 6. The God who had called Isaiah into relationship with himself has now become the God who calls Isaiah to embrace a new vision for his life's work. As we noted last week, Isaiah, yes, he was a man working for God. Since Isaiah chapter 1, he, he was the writer, the speaker of Isaiah's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So what's going on there in 6? After chapter 6, he's a man walking in the fullness of a life transformed and renewed by God. And there's a difference. Was he a Christian before? Was he a God follower before? Yes. Was he a God follower after? Yes. What was the difference? The difference was he had a radical encounter with God and he responded, yes. That's the difference. Notice the similarities between Samuel and Isaiah. Samuel hears the voice of the Lord, the Lord calling to him, and he responds, here I am. 
here I am. Well, here's Isaiah, and that same call of God comes, and he says it too. Here am I. Now, you might hear those words or look at those words and think, well, yeah, that's, that, that, that's simple. <coughs> They're just letting him know, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm present. It's kind of like a, God's taking roll call, right? He's like God's in the, in the classroom and just taking attendance. All right, uh, we got uh, Samuel here, Jeremiah here, Jonah. I'll be over there. Some of you will get that on the way home. Isaiah here. That's, that's not what's happening. That's not what's happening here. It's so much more than that. It's the acknowledgement of being fully present before your God. Attendance is after whether or not you're physically in the room. God's call is after whether the totality of everything you are is surrendered to the lordship of the king of kings. Do you see the difference? It's the first song we, we sang here this evening. I will love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. It's not just I'll love you with my strength. I'll love you with my strength. I'll love you with my strength. I'll be present. I'll go. I'll clean the church. I'll weed the garden. I'll fix the rot on the, on the church office. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do those things. I will love you by the things that I do. Great. That's a piece of you. I want your mind, and I want your heart, and I want your soul as well. That's what's behind the, the here, here am I. When God calls, and we understand that God is doing something magnificent in our lives, that it's a change moment, it's a crossroads moment where we are being called out of our routines and our path and God is doing something magnificent and we say God whatever you need to do do in me I hold nothing back from you what was the key to Isaiah's newfound calling what was the what was the secret what was that what was the key there for him to be able uh, to respond well, the key is right there back in verse 1. How is it that, that Isaiah could respond so wholeheartedly? Verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That's first person. Not he saw the Lord. Not they saw the Lord. I saw him. In a specific time. He, he's dating this time. As a matter of fact, this is a time in history where they didn't, have, they didn't know they were living in 600 B.C., okay? That, that's not, oh, next year's uh, 599 B.C. I wonder what's going to happen in zero, right? That's not how it worked. They, ra they counted their days on the death and the installation of a new king. When the new king starts and when the new king dies. And then the next king starts and the next king dies. So it's in the fifth year of Josiah or it's in the tenth year of Hezekiah or this is in the year that Uzziah died, Isaiah says, and something happened. I went to church, and the most unexpected thing happened. God was there. God showed up. And I've never been the same. Isaiah goes on to describe the smoke and the singing and the shaking of the walls. Quite a scene. Can you imagine what your response would be? Can you imagine? You went to church and God was there? What are you doing here? You'd never even get that much out of your mouth. Your mouth would be on the floor too quickly. What would your response be? We don't know how Isaiah is taking all this in until down in verse 5, he tells us. This is Isaiah's response to God showing up. Woe is me. That means, let me give you the modern day translation. I'm dead. I'm a dead man. I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean clean lips. This is God's prophet. This is God's spokesman. This is the guy whose job, whose vocation in life was to literally speak for God. What does he say? I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, 
the Lord Almighty. And it's here, and it's in this passage that we learn the secret of God's call to service. It's not really a secret. It's more like the keys to understanding God's call to service. First, he calls us to relationship to himself. That's, that's where any walk with God has to begin, acknowledging that God is real and that salvation comes to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And then the relationship begins. But as we walk in that relationship and as we walk in his light and in his truth, we begin to open ourselves up to the keys of understanding what he wants us to do. It begins and ends with learning your place before God Almighty. Three significant ways. First of all, we come to realize his great holiness. I tell you, I I don't know about your tradition, background, some, some maybe came out of very traditional, what we call high church uh, experiences, a lot of ritual, uh, some people call it smells and bells, a lot of bells ringing, a lot of smells going on, uh, a lot of things going on in, in church that you stand, you sit, you go through these, these motions and whatnot. Um, and, and some of us, perhaps in the Protestant side of, of, of faith, can look at a lot of that and in judgment, chastise. But I'll tell you one thing they get perhaps better than us is the holiness and a reverence for God, a lot of them. See, for a lot of us, he's, yeah, he's the man upstairs. He's, you know, he's like, God's just like grandpa in the sky. Just waiting to lavish good things on us and and, and, and make our path straight and easy and and bless us and give us what we want and, and, and make our lives good. Do you really want to be called into service for God? Are you really willing to do what he wants you to do? It begins with understanding this. He is a holy God, and that means he is so unlike you and me. So much so that every person, holy or not, in the Bible that had any kind of encounter with him, it was face to the floor. Why? Because God was thrusting him there by like some wind or some lightning bolt or some power that he was emoting over them? No, because it is the natural response. That's why it says in the book of Philippians, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Really? Hitler? Yes. Pharaoh? Absolutely. Everyone. Why? Because you can't help it in the face of holiness. The only difference between a Christian and everybody else walking the planet is we bow the knee now. We acknowledge now, and even in our acknowledgement, there's so little understanding of the holiness of God. How do we learn the keys to understanding what God may be doing in calling us to service? We delve into the holiness of God, but we don't stop there. We, at the same time, own our own unworthiness. We own it. We don't say, yeah, 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 I was kind of bad. I know people worse, but, you know, God saved me. I, I, you know, I, was, I wasn't great, okay? I, I did some bad things, but, I, you know, I was pretty okay. As if God's up there going, eh, he's pretty okay. Let, let him in. You know what, she's, she's mostly good. It's coming before God and saying, God, I bring nothing to the table. This is Isaiah, the guy who wrote one of the biggest books in the Bible, that God used to transmit his word. And how many times is the New Testament even quoting Isaiah about what Jesus had done, the prophecies that were to come to be fulfilled in Jesus himself? And here he is going, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king I and dead. If Isaiah feels that way, who, who are we? <laughs> who are any of us to go, you know what? I wasn't really that bad. But I, I, you know, the hell thing didn't sound so good, so I opted for the God thing. Embrace the holiness of God. Embrace 
the unworthiness that we are broken sinners before him and we can't fix it on our own. And here's the scandal. Number three, in the midst of our ruinedness, hearing God's call. And it's more than that. It's hearing and heeding God's call. But first, you've got to get over something. <laughs> and here's what you've got to get over. Me? Are you serious? Me? You, you know who you're talking to, right? It's, it's still me. And here's where we need to be careful with, with the second one up here. There are some Christians who fall in number, the, the, the number two trap so deep that they never get out. It's humility gone wild, right? I, I can't disciple anybody. I, I, I just, you know, I, I'm not spiritually mature. I never went to Bible college. I never studied theology. I don't know how to read Greek. I don't know how to ne- read Hebrew. You know what? Most of the people that know how to read Greek and Hebrew in the universities in this nation, you don't want to be following them anywhere, okay? The reality is it comes down to the relationship that God has been after from the outset. And at number three here, we say, I know I have nothing to bring to the table but the spiritual equivalent of five loaves and two fish. What can you do with them? And God goes, oh, watch. Watch what I can do. You're not even going to believe it. Hold on to my holiness. Hold on to the fact that it's not you. And watch what I can do. It's coming to terms with the reality that he has a purpose for you and for your life. In short, it starts with understanding the gospel. This is what I think this blueprint is. Understanding the gospel and allowing the gospel message to seep in with great humility. And that's it. That's how God calls us to serve. It's a call rooted in and built upon the gospel. And you know what it does? It blows away all the counterfeit motives for serving God. No more serving God out of guilt, trying to earn his favor. No more serving out of a sense of obligation, like some kind of New Testament law now that we have to follow. It's all gone. When I was uh, living in uh, Vienna, Austria, I, I had a Monday night Bible study with a group of guys. And uh, it, I, I made it a guys-only thing. It wasn't like an accountability group. It wasn't, I said, we're going to get together. And if you're interested in, in studying uh, the book of Romans, come on out on Monday nights and we'll do it. And I had five guys that came out. And if you know the book of Romans, the Romans is basically taking, uh, t- taking those, those three one, two, and three there, the holiness of God, owning our own unworthiness, and our ruinedness of hearing God's call. That's basically the, the short, quick outline to the entire book of Romans, okay? It's, it's the dissection of the gospel message in all of its fullness, okay? And it's laying bare in great depth uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and all we did every single week that we came together, I took a passage of Romans, and we read it, and we talked about it. And some of these guys have been Christians for a few years. Some of them were brand new Christians. And we wrestled with it, and, 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 and we'd pull it apart. Man, Romans 1 itself is like, we could just spend years on Romans 1. It was so densely packed. But we kept going, and eventually, somehow, by God's grace, we made it to Romans 2. I don't know how that happened, but we ended up in Romans 2 and Romans 3. And, and we're digging in, and we're digging in. And, and the strangest thing happened. I mean, life-changing thing for me to watch. All five of these guys came to the church where, where I pastored in, in, in Vienna, Austria. And one week, I noticed one of the guys started teaching a Sunday school class. What? What's he, what's he doing? And a couple weeks later, I noticed another guy volunteered to be part of a work team to help set up and and tear down the church where we were. Another guy asked to meet with me for accountability. He initiated. And I stood back and I watched and realized the gospel doesn't need me. 
I don't need to stand up and guilt people. I don't need to stand up and beg people to do stuff. I just stand back and watch the power of God through the message of the gospel, and he takes it from there. God was stirring people's hearts to serve him as they stared intently into the message of the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ. And they see the Son of God coming in all of his glory and giving his life up for him. And I never brought up Sunday school teaching. I never brought up anything. I I, I just kept talking about Romans. And God did the work. God drew out of them what he wanted them as they saw the holiness, the righteousness, the perfection of God and their own unworthiness before the gospel. And yet how that same God calls out to them. In their heart of hearts, they said, here am I. Here am I. Before we conclude, I want to just point out one more thing about God's call to service. Not only does God call a variety of men, women, young people, I cannot think of one character, however, in the Bible that was ever called to serve who did not, in some way, first have to endure the fire of hardship. You're like, oh, Pastor, couldn't you have ended on that high note? Why did you have to go there? Before God's call to radical service, Joseph would find himself wrongly accused and in prison. Moses would spend 40 years as a shepherd in a lonely wilderness. David would be anointed king and wait 25 years before assuming the throne. On the run, many of them. Mary would find herself pregnant with quite a story to tell. Struggle, trial, testing, They seem to always precede the call, and perhaps this is God's way of seeing what kind of of call you and I can handle. Remember when Jesus says, "You've, you've shown me faithfulness in a little, now I'll give you much. Do that little thing. Do that next right thing. Do that thing for my glory and my honor, and and, and watch the doors open. Because I, I knew you were faithful here, now I can be faithful there. But too often we come and it's like, all right, God, I, I just came to know you. Make me Billy Graham. <laughs> Have you talked to anybody about Jesus? No, not yet, but give me a big stage. Give me a big platform. Give me all the resources that I need. Be faithful in that hardship, in that trial, and look to him and watch what he does. Back to Isaiah, God was saying to him, okay, Mr. Eloquence, okay, Mr. Silvertongue, I've got an assignment for you, and here it is. Go and deliver my messages to my chosen people for the rest of your days, and know this, they're never going to listen. They're never going to heed your warnings. They're never going to change your ways, and you just keep talking. What would you say? What would you say? If I heard that call, I'd say, um, yeah, about that assignment, Lord, no disrespect, I don't mean to brag, but it seems like kind of a waste of talent. Seems like kind of a a, a fruitless thing you're calling me to. Yeah, God, uh, about that calling, I, I heard what you said, but might I be allowed to maybe embellish it a little bit and, and try to maybe kind of force the people to listen and obey? What does Isaiah say when he hears God's call to serve? Here am I. Send me. Not because I'm so talented, I have nothing to offer. Not because I'm somehow worthy, I am truly unworthy. Not because I know how this is all going to work out, I have no clue. But here I am. Isaiah goes about God's mission for his life for the same reasons the disciples walked away from their fishing boats. Jesus is God in the flesh. God in Isaiah 6, who will go for me? Isaiah says, here I am. Jesus, God in the flesh, calls out to his disciples, 
And they walk away from their boats, many of them. Walk away from their fishing nets, and they follow. I'm going to close with just the lyrics of a song that I've loved for, for a number of decades now. It's a song written by Stephen Curtis Chapman. And he writes about this. It's called For the Sake of the Call. For the Sake of the Call. And the whole point of the song is it was not the words that he used. It was not the, 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 the sermon that he gave. It was not anything, but it was the one who was calling. It was for the sake of that one who called them by name that they would follow. And the lyrics to the song go like this, just, just a couple of lines. Empty nets lying there at the water's edge told a story that few could believe and none could explain. How some crazy fishermen agreed to go where Jesus led with no thought to what they would gain. For Jesus had called them by name. And they answered, and here's the chorus, we will abandon it all for the sake of the call. No other reason at all but the sake of the call, wholly devoted to live and to die for the sake of the call. Let's pray. Father, for those that hear a message like this and and feel as if you are the God who is far off, who is far distant, who is hard to know, who is hard to understand and discern. Father, open, open their hearts to know that you are the God, Jesus Christ. You are the God who has called and continues to call us by name. And you say to us t- today, behold, today is the day of salvation. If you would put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we can know what it means to have purpose to come with all of our unworthiness before the worthiness of God and say, for the sake of the call, I will answer. I will go. Father, it's not that you've made yourself hard to find. You've made yourself plain. You've made yourself real. Open our eyes that we might see the beauty of Jesus.
Lord, may it be an enriching time, not just to our bodies, but to our spirits as well. Thank you for the fellowship of believers. We pray these things all in the majesty of Jesus our Savior. All God's people said, Amen.